Greetings from Trollville. This is Lloyd Kaufman, president of Troma Entertainment and creator of The Toxic Avenger. You know, folks, when we're not making those great movies like Poultry Guys, Night of the Chicken Dead, and Terra Firmer, and Tromeo and Juliet, we like to kick back and listen to Without Your Head, because Without Your Head is the greatest, the greatest entertainment on the face of the earth. Yes, listen to Without Your Head. The Troma team does, and the Troma team's been around for 35 years. Welcome back to the station of decapitation. I'm still Nasty Neal. I'm still Mama Creepy. Mm-hmm. And now we're joined by Scream Queen Debbie Rashawn. Welcome back to Without Your Head. Hey! <laughs> no, I, I was like, that's going to be really enthusiastic. No, nah, well, that didn't work. Hey, guys, how's it going? It's great to be back. Thank you for having me. It's awesome. Yeah, it's great to have you back. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> all right. I think we Fucking should just do this a, for, man. Yeah, we should just do that for a <laughs> <laughs> last time I did talk uh, so, so was, what's uh, that sir I was going to say last time I did talk to you was for Model Hunger which was, was great Oh, uh, your de- directorial debut any plans to continue to uh, direct films yes 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 absolutely oh my god but um, here's the thing uh in order to do something that you really want to do, as opposed to just doing things, just to keep doing things, like I see the okay. Let me stop. I see right. value in both avenues. There's a lot of value in just continuing to work, like you know, making movies and making movies and making movies, as long as you're progressing and stuff like that. And believe me, that's that's definitely a very important uh, way to go. Another way to go is if there's a few years in between because something has to really hit you, then Mm -hmm. that's also a very cool way to go. Uh, Some of the people that I respect the most go that way because until, because the thing is like, unless you're just churning them out and then delivering the, the footage or the finished product and just moving on and who cares about, you know, that thing that I just did or whatever, Unless you're doing that, I mean, really, you've got to live with a movie, like I've always said, for a good five years, maybe longer, you know, maybe longer, because, you know, you're obviously in the pre-production, you're in the production and the post, and then just because it's done, that's when everything else just gets started. So you've got to, you know, bring the awareness and you've got to you know, just breathe life into this, this being and, and try to find, you know, a good audience, AKA parents that will uh, take this, your baby on, so to speak. And um, so that's uh, the, the latter is obviously the way I'm going. And, uh, you know, maybe if I had, uh, you know, millions in the bank, it would be a lot uh, sooner in between, mm-hmm. but um yeah, just because of, you know, it's, you know, we're all, most of us are artists, so people understand there's lots of stuff, lots and lots of stuff that you do in between, be it, you know, acting, writing, all kinds of stuff that you do um, in between. But, you know, it's got to be something that you really want to say. And so that's what I've been working on. And I have been working on um, a new script with the same script writer, James Morgart, who wrote Model Hunger. So, um, you know, he's been, he just had a baby with his wife, which is amazing, like so amazing. And he's, you know, he teaches at universities. And so between the two of us, it's just, you know, when it, when it's ready, it's going to be really ready. It's going to be awesome. And that's when it's going to happen. It's not going to happen because, you know, I'm looking at my watch and I'm, and I'm on some time frame that I think is important when it's really not, you know, mm-hmm. so that, that's kind of where that's at, but it's going to, it's going to be amazing. Cause you know, just how much the, the volume of stuff that you learn is just insane. It's off the hook. And so, uh, you know, I'm just, um, I will be very, very, very excited to, to do the, um, 
second one for sure, for sure. And the good news is, I mean, you really find out who you click with and who you work with good and who is, you know, on the same level as you, as far as, you know, you get them, they get you and smooth, smooth. Mm -hmm. So that's what will happen. And that will yeah. probably be within a couple of years couple of years but like i said i mean unless somebody calls me up tomorrow and says um you know hey here's the money to do this new idea that you guys are working on it's uh it's probably going to take a good couple of years from now mm-hmm. yeah i have yeah. to say like for your director di- directorial it's a hard word to uh, say I'm, yeah. yeah i know i'm like uh my tongue's not working today uh model hunger was great <laughs> I absolutely loved it. Um, you did an amazing job on it. I loved the story too. It it was just it was a great movie. Um and, and especially, you know, you're talking about all the movies you've done. Um, you know, I looked it up, I couldn't believe the staggering amount of movies you've done, Debbie. Uh, on IMDB it lists that you've done two hundred and fifty two movies. <laughs> That is yeah, crazy. yeah. I mean, that's. Oh, I'm like, this. <laughs> I'm like, you ever have time for Maddie Petty? <laughs> yes. No. It's like it's it's very interesting that that you say this because um, and you know that doesn't include a lot of documentaries too that I work oh, yeah. on. And yeah, of course they're 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 of course they're not even remotely near like doing a movie but but i've been involved with a couple that that were and um so yeah i mean it, it go i used to joke that you know at 300 i would retire or whatever but um yeah i don't i don't really feel like it so <laughs> fuck that i mean i care. but the one the difference is now like you know okay going back make the story short um going back okay so in the late the early 80s, I, I did some extra work in movies. And mm-hmm. so, of course, uh, you know, became interested from there and uh, moved to New York and studied like a maniac, like at, at four different studios. Uh, the, by the late 80s, started getting film roles, tiny, extra, one line, two line, five lines, under 10, you know, and then building up from there. And then finally... Um, uh, a name with a, a solo credit card in the in the front of the film, uh, 94, you know, so that was sort of like how long it took me to get to that point. Um, but it, the thing is, it's, it's like, you know, especially in the beginning, that you're really taking a lot of work because you want the experience. Like it's not, you know, especially when it was film film and people really were not shooting on, um, certainly digital, let alone VHS, you know, Mm -hmm. like actual VHS at that point. Um, you really, it was so rare, you know, to be shooting on film, so much money and time and, and to be good literally in one take, because that's all they could afford. Um, these, so you, you would really get like a lot of your mistakes. First of all, you get a lot of your mistakes put down on, on film forever, but also you would take a lot of stuff for the experience. Right. And just to like get your, you know, to, to sharpen your teeth, to, to get your chops. I mean, just to put your, um, acting to work and see what flies, what doesn't work, what works. And, and, you know, it's its own acting class in its own way. So bottom line is you fast forward to a time now where everything's on digital and you could do a million takes and people really are making like micro mini movies on Instagram every day. Like, you know, this is what's happening. It's so, people are so comfortable in front of cameras now, relatively so. Like I'm saying, acting is a completely different story. However, people are more confident and people are aware of shots. You know what I mean? All these things that it changes everything so dramatically that, um, you know, back then, you know, you didn't even have to think that anybody was ever going to see the movie. Like, let alone... Um, you know, live forever 
in, in the digital world or YouTube and all these different places. So half the time, you know, you were just doing stuff thinking, you know, no, no, no one's going to see this. What 10 people, no one I know is ever going to see this. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, you know, that's kind of how it, it starts in the beginning. And then of course we've come to the, the moment in time where, um, you know, there's, there's nothing that you can do that, that you can ever get rid of. It's the opposite. <laughs> Oh. I don't know how I got to this point in the story. Nice. I have yeah. no idea if you asked me that question, but here we are. <laughs> well, I, think it was the you, you, I think you mentioned 250 movies, and there right. you go. You got yeah. it. That's my rant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of the, the stuff you did with trauma, too. Um, and I, I actually I hadn't seen it before, and uh, I watched the uh, Debbie Rashan. Uh, confidential, my years in Drumville exposed, and I mean, I had I got yes. a kick out of it um, because our our friend in common, Gary Cook, I noticed that on the wall in some of the shots were pictures that he had done, <laughs> and that just I that cracked me up. But how did you find your? Do you think that you were kind of honing your chops? like you were saying, um, when you were working with trauma, um, and how did you find, cause, um, you know, we've heard from other people, you know, some people really loved working with trauma. Some people didn't, um, you worked for trauma for a long time. Uh, how, and now like you're going to be, um, in the death house and Lloyd Kaufman's and that also, um, what kind of relationship do you still have with trauma? Oh, that's a great question. Actually. It's a really good one. And it's a really complicated one because anytime <laughs> you have a relationship, <laughs> it goes back that far, like to 92. It's a complicated relationship. Okay. So, um, okay. First of all, did I learn any chops? Absolutely did. Um, and what did I personally learn versus maybe somebody else who, who did similar things or their own thing with them? I um, kind of brought in, I was studying improv with Chicago City Limits, which was a place in New York City. It wasn't in Chicago, but um, they had classes there and it was improv classes. So I, w I was taking them all the time. So what I, I really brought or tried to bring to the broader comedies like Terra Firmer more than say Tromeo and Juliet. Cause you know, Tromeo and Juliet, I'm still like insanely green as an actor, like, but giving it my all, giving it my all, 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 but very, you know, uh, pretty inexperienced. Um, then Terra Firmer had the little jump there. And, and that was because I was really, um, sort of wrapping my brain around, uh, looking at it through the right, uh, glasses. Okay. Not being silly. And I, I'm self-aware that the camera's on me being completely 1000% authentic, but at the same time using the skills that you would use in a totally absurd, absurdist comedy like something way out there, like the, the most extreme, you know, body comedy, liter literally, that you could possibly do. But, yeah. And so, exactly. But at the same time, really do the work so that you believe it. Because there's that thing, like what makes, and I'm not saying this is trauma or this is not trauma. I'm just like saying what makes a great bad movie or a great, great movie is when people do it sincerely. And so that's the only way anything is going to fly. Like whether it, you just love it because it's great and it's genius, and funny, or if you love it because like it, it tries so hard, but it misses the mark. And honestly, that's not my opinion of trauma, but I'm mixing that in there because my point is sincerity and, and doing the work and, and not just saying, oh, it's a trauma movie, so I just have to act like an idiot in front of the camera and then it'll be great. Mm -hmm. No, it's... um. It's, it's being, yeah, it's being free, 
but it's also doing the work. So like it's, it's a combination of stuff. So I learned a lot about that, and I learned a lot about pitching. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, that's where I learned an awful lot about pitching, which I love doing. So this is a great gift that trauma has given me. Um, and uh, I love Lloyd, and uh, we've had like 90 to 95% fucking amazing relationship just absolutely fantastic when i had my hand accident he was the the only one in the first one who who sent me a little bit of money to help me get through uh yeah. without me asking and just like when i had my brain surgery i mean seriously this is like a novel in itself when i had my uh brain tumor removed when i woke up from surgery he was the first one sitting there so, I mean, this is, this is very, it's a very real friendship. It's not, there's nothing, you know, not real about it, but, um, you know, it's, have we had our ups and downs? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, you know, he's as, as funny and, and smart and just educated and on the ball. He's also very eccentric and you know he's he's it's like riding a roller coaster sometimes and and i i have no doubt that i am the same way so there has been times where it's been like like he was in model hunger and i had a role in model hunger we were both door to door salesmen and i cut us both out because it didn't we had to get to the point of the movie quicker see what i mean mm-hmm. it, it slowed up the movie too much so there are extras on the dvd I, I didn't matter if he admits it to me or not. I know for a fact that he's mad about that. <laughs> so, you know, it, it you know, it, these things happen and he's <laughs> pissed off, <laughs> but you know, he, it's not like he hasn't pissed me off before. So, I mean, you do the, you go through these little things up and down and, and throughout the years and stuff like that. But I mean, the love is always there. I mean, it's always there because if you didn't care, it wouldn't make you upset, right? So it's, it's, I love the guy. I, I feel like he's, I love him like a relative, like a, a close, good relative. And, and um, yeah, I, I, I'm so proud that he's, that he has that uh, musical and, and I don't know if it's still running in, in England, but boy, oh boy, that Toxic Avenger musical is doing great. And I'm just really happy for him because, okay, also just flashing back in the beginning, when I started working for them, um, they were, um, they definitely had the high point with the Toxic Avenger, then around Kabuki Man release. That's mm-hmm. kind of when I met him, when I was, when I was doing like uh, cable TV skits. Like, you know, stuff that was in between the the trauma movies that they would run. They would have skits. So it was like the first stuff I would do with trauma in 92. So, um, you know, he, he really, there was, it was sort of going on a downswing in the sense that that's when the, uh, what was it? The Morton Downey show happened <laughs> yeah. and all this, all this stuff happened where everybody was just absolutely trashing trauma, like big time. And for real, like anybody who would work with them, if you went on and you wanted to do anything um, of, of any financial value, I'll put it that way. You'd have to take them off your resume. You'd have to take them off your resume. That would be the first thing anybody would take you. Get that off. But then with Tromeo and Juliet, then Terra Firmer, and then you fast forward again, and now they've been in the culture for so long that finally he has sort of the main, I wouldn't say main stakes. He's always had that. He, it's the, he has the um, respectability that he, that would come and go throughout the, the years of trauma, right? The, mm-hmm. the various uh, incarnations of trauma. So I, I'm happy to say that I've been able to see him and the company and, and his movies, which are a piece of him, you know, it's his art, um, come like full circle and that, that no matter what, they are, he's just, he's got respect now, just period, respect period. 
and there's no, you know, there may be people who don't care for his movies, but he is a part of pop culture period, much like John Waters. So I'm glad that I really got to see that whole, you know, career, I wouldn't say transformation, but you know what I mean? That whole, um, trajectory, I guess. Mm-hmm. So what was it like to, to do a, to do a new trauma film in uh, return of the Newcomb high volume two? You mean like recently? Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it was, it was, a, okay. So it was a lot of fun. He, um, uh, let, let me flashing back. He, when we shot it, I, we didn't know that we were making two <laughs> movies. Like mm-hmm. he was going to cut them into two, like volume one and two. So, um, when they were shooting in, in Buffalo, staying at a friend of mine's place. And so there was this whole other couple of scenes and true to trauma tradition, style and fashion, they were, uh, everything was, you know, running behind and, and changing things up and, and everything was all over the place. So, uh, the couple of the scenes he couldn't get before I had to leave. So they were just kind of left. But then later on, I went to uh, Queens and I shot, um, some pickup stuff with, with him to finish it off. Now, what, what did I think about my experience there? It was kind of yeah. multifold. Like on one hand, it was great, great fun. Like especially when we were doing the pickup scenes, believe it or not at the trauma building. Like mm-hmm. it was, we just like duplicated that we were in the, um, shower at the, uh, at the high school and, you know, mm-hmm. Doug Sackman was there and all these people, um, some I knew some I didn't, but it had that, that familiar feel because I did the entire, um, the, uh, what was it? The not cat trauma cafe, but the trauma's edge TV. I did all of those episodes with Doug as the, the director and cinematographer. <laughs> so I'm like really, really comfortable with him. And it, that was, that was like a highlight for me. Ironically, the stuff up in Buffalo was a lot of fun, but like, you know, very typically you would, there would be some, um, very new people on the scene and stuff. And they were, I just found it to be, you know, there wasn't like when I went in the, say in the nineties and stuff, there wasn't the sort of like camaraderie that there was for the most part on, on those other movies. It was more like, um, and I'm not talking about like the leads. I'm talking about people who were, you know, a couple of lines or something. It's, it almost yeah. seemed almost like people were trying to position, you know, and thinking it's, you know, if I just, you know, elbow my way in and I don't know. I, I, so that kind of put me off a little bit, but I had to, you know, say to myself, well, you know, this is a, uh, this is like, it's their thing now. Like, you know, I'm it's not that I'm done with it in the way that mm-hmm. that would sound, but that's, you know, that's, that's, that's their thing now. I'm just, I, I should be here for fun, but didn't have a lot of fun when I was shooting in Buffalo, uh, but did have a lot of fun when I was doing some pickup scenes in New York city, uh, or at Queens actually with him. So, mm-hmm. Again, that that's the trauma experience. I mean, that's totally top to bottom the trauma experience. I mean, it just it just is. I mean, it's it's controlled chaos and it's uh, you know chaotic control. <laughs> Whatever the opposite is, it's both it, it's both ends of the Zen spectrum. It's, it can be the best fucking time, life changing time, and it can be like the dregs and that could be in one day, you know, you can have both experiences <laughs> uh-huh. in the same day. So mm-hmm. I totally get why people would love it. And I totally get why people would not love it. Mm-hmm. Um, now in uh death house, I mean, not to give any too much away or anything, do you and Gloria have any scenes together? No, not at all. I'm, I'm not even sure what his character was uh, in that movie because he did it after I did mine. I came in and did the Leatherlace uh, tribute to Gunnar Hansen. I'd known 
I've known Gunner for a really long time. As a matter of fact, mm-hmm. we used to exchange, okay, are you guys sitting down? We used to exchange <laughs> handwritten letters. Yes, that's right, <laughs> folks. Handwritten letters in the mail um, with each other. And we would always say to each other, you know, like say what's going on and everything. And, and you know, the, you like this convention or that one. And there was only a few at that time. Um, mm. And they were far more indie friendly than the conventions are now. Um, mm. Hello. But, um <laughs> You know, he would then he would always end end up saying, you know, we have to, you know, do something uh, together someday. And so when we did, we did Hellblock 13 was the first of like maybe 10 movies that that we made together. And um, the interesting thing and the reason I'm going into the story is because. You know, I'm sure many, many people are just going to say, oh, you know, that's blasphemous. Oh, it's blasphemous. But no, no, I I really, really knew him well. And he was a friend. And as a matter of fact, he he got me a job on this one film. It was called uh, Apocalypse and the Beauty Queen. And um, it was... It was really cool because it was one of the highest paying jobs I had ever gotten certainly at that point. And he would always lecture me in the most kindest way about, you know, I always felt like, you know, I, I just wanted, when I went to conventions, you know, I just wanted to like give stuff to people like, you know, give, give the, give the pictures to have wanted to and everything. And he said, you know, he just taught me, he said, you, you're not, you're literally, you have to eat. You're not going to make any money making the movies or very, very little. It's not like you're intentionally trying to rip people off. It's Mm -hmm. that you have to pay for these things to be made and you have to eat. So he would, he would constantly, he was, he was a mentor in a lot of ways because he really, you know, uh, and, and still to this day, I don't, um, I don't take all of his advice um, as far as what he would have liked me to do. And it was, it's probably to my own detriment, but he always was um, uh, giving me advice and after me and, and uh, saying, you know, whether it be films or something like that, like, I got to charge more. I'm like, ah, the poor guy's got, you know, no money. (laughs) I mean, like, I was always so sympathetic because I came from such a poor home, but you know, it's, it's right. The sad thing is, and here's another tangent. I'm taking down a whole nother road here. (laughs) Um, that, you know, when you, when you do people favors, here's the fucked up thing, people, seriously, when you do people favors, and you help them say they were, when they're starting out, no matter what it is, be it a, a actor, director, whatever the case may be, a writer, even um, you're there, you know, you want to help them. And, and, you know, you have no idea what the product's going to be like because, you know, it's their maybe first time out or whatever. And uh, you're, you're there for them and, and, you know, for scraps really. And, uh, but you're there for all the right reasons. And then a couple few projects down the road, they're, they have moved on, for example. And this is a story that Gunnar would tell me all the time. And, you know, of course, I experienced it uh, many times myself. And the thing is, when people say people pay, they respect you. This is just a sad truth. Do I wish it wasn't that way? Of course. But, you know, when people pay you your worth, what's that? Oh, absolutely. I I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. So, I mean, and then going back to um, off that tangent, going back to the, the leather lace character. So, yeah, my character is kind of like... Um, almost a, a strange, well, kind of an example of what happens to the prisoners and sort of a flashback of why I'm even in there, which is, you know, uh, sawing people up and stuff. And Gunner as a hologram even appears in the scene that I'm in. So mm-hmm. that's kind of my function in the movie. That doesn't give anything away. Um, so it's just symbolically, he wrote, Gunner had actually wrote that leather lace character uh, for a female um, 
And that's what I did in the movie. But I guess the bottom line is I'm not even sure what Lloyd played in the movie because I wasn't there when he shot his scenes. So mm. I'm kind of imagining he was probably either a prisoner or a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? I mean, does anybody uh, know? I, I don't know. know. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we should have we, a we got to ask him. We got to ask him. Or- yeah, we have a caller on the line, 407 area code. Who are you? Hi, um, I wanted to, I had a question for Debbie Rashawn. Um, Debbie, I was curious uh, what, you know, with the Weinstein thing that's happened and all of the, uh, the harassment stuff that's in the media, I'm curious, um, being that horror, the genre, by its nature, tends to have roles that are more, you know, uh, exploitive for women what what is your kind of what has been your experience with it and and what is your uh kind of commentary on what's going on right now in the industry oh you know bad seriously i am so happy (laughs) that you asked me that yes (laughs) no i am very very happy because this is this is a really really big deal it's a really big deal because okay but first of all before i tell my story i have to go back a little bit and just put in context for people who either weren't around or forgot that in the 90s um and i want to say hollywood reporter but it might have been another trade magazine i'm not sure uh but anyway um jim lenorski was uh, interviewed, I think, along with Fred Owen Ram. Pretty sure it was also with him. But it was they, they wrote an article about B movies, right? Horror movies, B movies mm-hmm. uh, that were filling the the shelves at Blockbuster. And right in the article, um, Jim Wynorski said, "Woman won't sleep with me. She's not getting a leading role." And this was like, you know, a big yuck yuck. I mean, it was mm-hmm. it was hilarious. It was a knee slapper, and everybody was like. Good for him. He's like telling it like it is. Like they, they were just thinking, oh, the the good old boy type of thing. And this is, I'm not making a judgment one way or another on Jim Wynorski. I have never worked with the guy, but I'm just saying that 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 uh, temperament in the '90s, and this is what we're talking about with uh, Weinstein and everything, right? In the '90s, it was like really, it was almost like a uh, red badge of courage, if you will, that he was like, everybody was doing it, but he was the only, you know, son of a bitch that was going to actually say it out loud. You know what I mean? So, and in print. And so it was like very funny. And, you know, it was, again, it was the, the good old boy thing. And I have like so many, so many stories of stuff that's happened that I, I could probably only be able to, to choose one and tell that story. Um, um, <clears throat> when I was first started working for uh femme fatales magazine, um, I was, the editor was, his name was Bill George and he was brought on by uh, Fred Clark, who was the, the publisher. So early, like right before they even printed their first issue, um, I was making like a indie movie out in Long Island and the guy had gotten in touch with, uh, actually Tony Timpone from Pangoria. And he said, well, that's not right for us, but you know, there's this guy doing this new magazine called Femme Vitales and, uh, you, you know, this story sounds better for them. So he gets in touch, end up doing the story. I end up writing it like a diary, likes the writing. So asked me to stay on. Well, the bottom line to the story is basically wanted to make me, and I was just learning my chops as a writer. This is the early 90s. Um, He wanted to make me the associate editor. And I said, that's how? Like, yeah, we wouldn't want to be, but I don't understand because I don't know what this job is. I'm learning my chops in, in writing. You know what I mean? I'm still writing fluff pieces at that point. I'm not writing pieces that make, you know, everybody hate me like I do now, you know, now I write, uh, they're so honest. It's like, Oh my God. Um, but anyway, <laughs> whole nother story there. <laughs> well, you know, it's all, it's all honest now. That's what I got going for me. Um, so, um, bottom line is he demanded 
that for me to continue on with the magazine, which keep in mind, sure, there was technically an internet, but not really in the early 90s, like not in the sense that we know it or the average Joe knows it today. So magazines were it, like that was it, that's all there was. And so um, when I said no to him saying, you got to come down to Baltimore and move in with me, and we'll run the magazine. But, you know, of course I got all the cues of all the other stuff going on that he wanted to happen. Um, and I was like, no. And so he was just like, okay, you're out. And he blackballed me. He called people. He called everybody that would listen to him. And he told them that if they did not hire me, meaning that some of these people were obviously, you know, talking to me and in the process of hiring me, if they did not hire me, uh, he would give them, in some cases, he would promise to cover in some places, uh, uh, situations, I should say, six page article. Now you, you really have to put in perspective what that meant without the internet around. That was like, all you had, that was everything, right. Was the, the physical magazine. And so like he, he literally did this for seven years and I was just like, you know, fuck you. I'm going to fucking make it on my own. I'm going to like, you know, you're not going to be able to hold me down. So again, that goes back to taking what you can, you know, taking what you can, because, you know, there was still the great guys out there like uh, Paul Talbot who directed Hellblock 13 that I did uh, with Gunnar Hansen, ironically coming back all the way around to that, who he had told, no, if you put in, you know, so-and-so instead of her, then I'll give you all this coverage. And Paul Talbot was like, no, no, uh, that's, I, I asked Debbie, I want Debbie, that's it. So anyway, seven years after the fact, after he had done that to me, which was, I I think that was, uh, 94. Um, I got a, a call from, uh, Fred Clark out of the blue. And he said to me to write out everything that, uh, Bill George had done to me. Right. So I did. And, um, he kept calling me, calling me, you know, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Because, you know, I was uh, working at some internet radio station and, and I was busy like producing radio and stuff. And finally, but maybe about two weeks after he asked me, I, I got it done and, and put it in the mail. And, um, but he kept like calling me, calling me. And I thought that was so weird. You know, why is he like, why is this all of a sudden out of nowhere? So important. So finally he said, well, okay, you did it. Um, can you fax it over and then drop the hard copy in the mail? And I said, sure. So he gets it and he reads it and he's, he's floored. He's floored. He's like, this is a mini series. This would be like an amazing uh, mini series that nobody would believe it's so outrageous because, you know, I didn't even touch on the stuff that, that this guy had, had done and, and tried to do to me and, and my career and everything um, to you guys. Um, but anyway, the next thing you know, a couple of days later, he commits suicide. Hmm. Fred Clark, the, the publisher. And so he was putting together um, a, a folder for his wife, who obviously didn't know he was going to be doing this, to give her the clout to make sure that Bill George could not keep that magazine, that she would have the, the legal proof that he was, you know, abusing power, doing all this kind of stuff. Um, and that she would, upon his death, get sole possession of the magazine. And so that's exactly what happened. And then by the time my physical letter arrived, he was already dead and his wife got it. And so ironically, the first thing she did as, you know, basically, I'm so sorry that you went through all that for all those years with this guy. She first thing she did was put me on the next cover. Like, and that was just, you know, just a cover, but still the point, the point was, I hear you. You know what I mean? I hear what you've been through and I hope this helps. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. And, 
And there is like so many stories like that. So, so many. And, and I often think to myself, like, you know, I'll work with a lot of people in the business and, and, you know, it's in, in the cases of, of like some actresses, not all, but some, it's like, okay, we well could tell when they were with this guy, cause they did all these movies and then pretty much nothing. And then this other one, you know, be it man or woman, the guy could be, you know, with a, a man or a woman in the business for that reason too. It's like, you could almost track with certainly not everybody, but a lot of people when they were like super busy, they were sleeping with somebody who was, doing a lot of movies at that time. I mean, like, you know, it's a pretty, pretty obvious stuff. And, and the fact that we're actually, maybe we're not talking about that side of this equation, which is the women and men who um, sleep with people to get what they want. We're, we're not talking about that part of the equation. We're talking about the power side. Um, it's, it's just been so long in coming. I feel like, you know, when I went through all that and, and I would, I would tell people I, I wrote about it in Fangoria quite a few years back, uh, when I still had my, my column and stuff. And, uh, actually when I was on the cover, I'd meet that part of the, the story and, um, people didn't read even that recent, just, you know, seven, six, seven years ago, people did not want to hear that. They did right. not want to hear it at all they they you know did if, if anything it made things worse for me but it made things better for me because i was being truthful and i was being right. open about it and that's that w- was my payoff but yeah so and how do i feel about it well i think it's it's absolutely it's always been this way and thank God we're even allowed to be talking about it right now. Do I think people will abuse the system? Like uh, people who falsely um, claim against other people? Sure. Sure. They will. Sure. They will. How do I know that? Because even when nine 11 happened, there was people who were selling t-shirts down at ground zero in the dust. So there will always be, the, the leeches and the, the scum that try to profit off in some way off of these things. But generally speaking, I think it's a thousand fantastic and, and uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's great. Oh, exactly. uh, the conversation has, has begun and it's just like, you know, unfortunately now we're going backwards with Trump, aren't we? We had, we were having conversations about, um, you know, gay rights and, um, people being able to marry the person they love, regardless of, mm-hmm. of, you know, what gender you are and I am and who cares to mm-hmm. love each other. Um, right. and now we're just, we just seem to be going backwards like the, fucking speed of light here it's phenomenal but but at one point when those floodgates opened it was so freeing and nice and um even though those doors are trying to shut which we're going to do everything we can to keep them open um i feel like for women in the workplace those doors have sort of been blown open um so it, it can only be a good thing it can only be a good thing and think about it just like the women's lib thing right It went, everything has to almost go too far because it will swing back to a a comfortable, in a good way, place. But, But quite often things have to go to the extreme in order for them to become the norm. All right. Now, I, here's, here's the other side of that question that I, cause I, cause I, you know, I see a lot of people who are, who are coming forward and I know a lot of people are going to be like tearing up a lot of stuff that happened to them in their, in their careers and stuff right now and kind of reliving it. And I know that you were injured. You had your hand injury and, um, that they didn't, they didn't help you with that injury because it probably wasn't on an insured set. And then you have this kind of thing happen in publishing so how do you, how do you move past that? Cause I, cause I know you and you've not let that make you bitter. You've not made that turn you into a person who is cynical. Um, and you're still creative and you're still producing. So how do you do that? How is you, how have you personally been able to transform that and not become a victim of it? Like so many other people. 
Right. Yes. Yes. And another excellent question because that that would be the easy thing to do. And I think the only thing that I I do have self destructive qualities. I have to be very very careful with my um, diet and everything. Like that, I do. You know, there are things that I do that I have to be very very careful with. However, when it comes to this other stuff, there's something in me that I've had since a kid. And that was, you know, when I was on the street and, you know, I had people trying to, you know, pimps trying to turn me out even like, and I was have none of that. And the reason is I, I, from a very early age, I had a will of, of fucking steel in so many ways. Um, and when people would try, when people would say no, I like, I would either completely block it out or I would just, I would just sit and think, okay, this is square and this is round. How the fuck am I going to get it in there? And I wouldn't stop thinking until I got it in there. Like I just would, that was my mentality. And whenever these things come up, it's not that they don't have that effect on me. Uh, but they, I just get, I, I, I use my anger is what I do. Like for example, with the publishing thing, um, the first thing I did was I went out and this was during the big, the black ball when I was blackballed during that period. The first thing I did was I went to everybody that I knew and I said, you know, I've got all this stuff coming out. I can give you some really fucking great pictures. And I tried to get as many covers as possible so that no matter what he said, that people would still see me. It wasn't about ego. It was about business. Like you're not going to try to make my brand, if you will, evaporate because, you know, so I had that um, goal. I had that like, like just fucking laser focus going to do that. Um, With the hand, it did bring me down for, I probably was out of, sorts, I would say, for about two years, for about two years, so I didn't feel safe on a set. So, I mean, I just would have like really bad panic attacks and all this kind of stuff. But I, I slowly got more and more comfortable and got back into it to the point where I could just throw myself into a character and not have that underlying I know I'm going to get like, you know, very badly hurt if I let go like I did that time. Cause that, you know, these scars, you just work through them. Right. I mean, we, we've all, there isn't anybody walking the earth who hasn't like suffered some kind of shit. That's for sure. So mm-hmm. I just, you know, I just kind of let the, the good thing is, is when I get angry, when I get angry, I get a lot of stuff done when, you know, it's the depression stuff that you got to be really careful of because depression is just, you can't really do much with that. That just brings you down. You got to like, let it turn into anger and then use that energy. Uh, Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Babs. (laughs) Uh, We also have a caller 270 area code. Uh, Who are you? Yeah, Debbie, I want to know when you're coming down to Kentucky for a a film expo or something. Oh, Keenan? Yes. (laughs) See, I could recognize people's voices. Um, I don't know at this point. I do not know. My next uh, Kentucky, Kentucky trip, as it were. Um, I'm not sure. I, I couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you. Get on the yeah, horn. I'm going to have to get busy and try back. and get somebody to yeah. bring you in. There you exactly. go. That's yeah. all you got to do. <laughs> you know what? The good thing about all this is you can make anything happen, people, including if you want me to come and see you. <laughs> <laughs> like, just call your convention. Have them, have them, uh, have me in. Uh, I love doing it. So. There you go. It's all in your court, man. I put it in your court. <laughs> Make it happen, Keenan. <laughs> okay, hon. I because I'm, I'm packing hey, my bag as you speak. Yeah, we will just have to see what we can do. 
Right. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, thanks for calling in, Keenan. Did you have another question? Or? No, I was really wanting to ask her what she thought about everything that's going on today, but unfortunately, I got beaten to it. So <laughs> that's all right. You got to hear it. That's okay. Bab, Babs is uh, she? She's all over it. So that's good. No, yeah. but um, I, yeah, I think I think all of us are feeling this way, and I do appreciate everybody wanting to bring it up because isn't it fascinating in the world of exploitation? Like, yeah, what is going on there? Can you only imagine? But the thing is, I've often said that you know, even though we all have all kinds of stories. I've I've always thought to myself, you know, it's got to be even worse in Hollywood because, you know, yeah, what know. you would have to do for for that kind of fame, whereas with um, I don't know, but like with the exploitation stuff, it's almost like it's it's, you know, it, it's it is what it is already, you know, there, there's no hidden secret, so to speak. And, um, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of like trifling going on and, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, between all sorts of people, but there's, there's um, so many people yeah. in power because there's so many people in power out there who are willing to abuse that power. And, you know, what's the starlight going to do? Right. No, exactly, exactly. And the other side of the coin that I keep going back to, too, because I agree with that. Like, I couldn't agree with them more. I've seen it. I've experienced it. It's like, uh, it's just the way that the, it, this world is spun on that since day one. And it's still that way in many countries where women aren't even allowed to show their faces. Just saying. Okay, so um, on the other side of things, too, you have an awful lot of women um, who play the guys for the roles or whatever it may be, or to direct or, or any, whatever position that you want to talk about, you know, what it could be anything. It could even, it could be writing, who knows, but anything in the arts, you know, or a man playing in another man or a woman, it could go either sex, but th- that mm-hmm. exists too. And that's the other half of the conversation. Like, you know, yeah. when, when someone is just being completely, uh, someone is just manipulating their way to the top, but they, but it's by their choice, you know, how, so then if someone's not interested in going that route, that is what they have to compete against. And no amount of schooling is going to matter. Is it? No, it isn't. Is it? No. And and, and, I mean, Uh and you've got things like, who was Terry Crews that came up saying that he'd been sexually harassed by a male, you know, but everybody was telling him to shut up, you know, nobody wanted to hear his story so recently. I know. And that's, and that's the other side of it too, is that some people, um, have been trying to speak and people have not been, um, listening and, and they've been treating them like, how dare you expose this? You know, don't be an asshole. You got to play the game, man. And, but now, you know, there, it's not like, Oh, everybody's just, you know, either making it up or trying to think of a scenario that wasn't perfect and then ratting someone out. No, it's not like that. It's that people have been sitting on these stories for a long time and they're seeing that the the climate right now, it's okay. So they're just, they're, everybody's going for it. So like I say, everything, everything swings to the extreme. So a lot of people still have to get a lot of shit out and this will happen and things will, mm-hmm. there will have some something will come out of this and i and i couldn't tell you what it's going to be but you know thank god it's it's happening that's all i have to say mm-hmm. yeah no, it's, it's, scary thing thank that, god it's uh, happening you know, it's only going to get better yeah. thanks for you calling know? in keenan yeah. thanks for Do calling. what uh thanks, thanks for calling for in calling. thank you thank you I'll, I'll say good night and let you talk to her bye okay bye. thanks bye. You know, i think uh <laughs> One thing that you had mentioned about, you know, people, you know, making things up to, you know, um, Neil and I have talked about this, like with conventions and stuff, you know, how easy it would be for somebody to completely 
make up a scenario and make it, you know, with everything that's going on, make it come off real. I mean, I even came up with a situation where there was somebody who I'm not going to name, but he was kind of a prick at a convention I was at. Well, I can prove that he and I were both at the same convention, you know, and it would be easy for me to say that this person sexually harassed me or whatever and to go blow it out, you know, go to the paparazzi, you know, because that would be my first Mm -hmm. first thing to do it. Go to the paparazzi, not go to the police, go to the paparazzi. And I could ultimately very easily right now destroy this person. You know, and right. it's like going to conventions now, and it's almost scary. You know, um, I'm like Neil. We got to watch ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in all <laughs> honesty, yeah. we got to behave. You know, it's like show, uh, it didn't necessarily. Uh, it was weird at the time, and I'm by no means a ladies' man or anything. But there was at a convention where a woman grabbed me uh, by my um, by my penis, <laughs> and, I, and it was. Uh, like I didn't yeah. say I ruined my life or anything, but ah, yes, I did it too. I could have. Ah, yeah. hey, come on, you gotta I love it. it. Sure, I'm you, know, and I now. Up, you know, I was at a convention and you know, the weirdest part, part the about it was, was their boyfriend oh. was there and just was staring with this very bizarre grin on his face, and so I, I it was it was a bizarre experience. But you know, get some interesting. It's a funny people. story. But uh, Tom, no, uh, John it, it's a very it good point. Of, yeah. yeah, it did give me a bottle yeah. of vodka. So. No, there you go. Uh, John Barrowman, part of his photo ops, like I, I got a photo op with him at a convention, and he gets up and he's like, "Okay, I won't grab your John, gen- you know, no genitalia, but ladies, I'll grab your boobs, got, you know, I'll grab your butt, whatever." So, you know, I've got a picture of him grabbing my boobs, um, but. That, like his husband was right there and like when I did my autograph you know I came up to him and I told him that he has the nicest ass out of all the you know companions on Doctor Who you know and it's like I totally sexually harassed him you know that's mm-hmm. flat out totally sexually harassed him you know I've got a picture of him grabbing my boobs I paid that man to grab my boobs you know <laughs> and it's just like no yeah. you know, now with the way things are, he's not going to be able to do that anymore. You know, it's like no, well, that's I not going to be that. on his list of things to sell. He's not going to have yeah. boob grabbing yeah. as an option on his little, you know, selling <laughs> card. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's, that's, like, that's hey. a shame. I mean, yeah, for the her. people who wanted it. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, not yeah. the people who don't want it, but <laughs> what about the yeah, people who want you know? it? Right. It was all in good fun and everything, but it's just like now it would be so easy for someone to be like, yes, he did it and I didn't want yeah, it. Yeah, well, you can, and, even, you can even take you a know? picture that was clearly you you were joking around, uh, which yeah. you see uh, <laughs> recently, and uh, say, you know, something else happened. Even if it's clear, clear, it looks like people are joking around in it. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like uh, it's in I one know. of those times. But uh, speaking yeah. of uh, of grabbing boobs and stuff, I really like Debbie and Killer Rack. I thought that was a hilarious move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. You can take him still from that and say that I was uh, <laughs> I was sexually harassing the actress by uh, going to almost constantly going towards her breasts and almost getting them. Um, yeah. a million times throughout that movie. <laughs> I'll be. I, I when That's I heard the so name, funny. I thought, well, this might be kind of silly, or whatever. But maybe it's not my. But I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. It's it's a really well made movie. And honestly, uh, I brought this up when we had Gregory Lamberson on. I thought you were so funny in it, and he said a lot of the stuff was just you, uh, kind of going off and, and and doing your own thing in the movie. Yeah, exactly. That's like, it's like usually when things work best, and like I don't say that lightly because I've wor- worked with a lot of people who are really good writers, and Greg is one of them. Um, but in the and well, th- this is actually written by not Greg, but someone uh, else who had won the uh, screenplay award and who was also one of the stars in the movie. But um, yeah, that, that's the thing about when you work with uh, someone who knows you and they're good at what they do and they let you 
go. And the nice thing about uh, Killer Rack is that um, it, it too, like the Toxic Avenger, has turned into um, a musical yeah, that's yeah. playing in Buffalo, New York. So that, that's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. That is great. And uh, well, you worked with uh, Gregory before on uh, Slime City Massacre. Uh, so, yeah. what are your thoughts on Gregory? And what was it like to be like a, a an exposed head in in in, in a Nevada slime? <laughs> well, it was, well, it's, it's so funny when you're again when you're doing certain things. Um, in person versus when you're watching them. It's like such a huge difference. Um, <laughs> right, first right. of all, I got, I got, I got to say that, um, when, when he had contacted me about doing a sequel to slime city, I was like over the moon because uh-huh. I love slime city. I love slime city. Yeah. I love all the, the movies from the eighties, the Frank Henry water, I... you know, Lloyd stuff before I met him and slime city. And they all fit into this sort of like New York city yeah, 100%, 300%. category. Yeah, and so like, I was like, Oh my God, this is fucking great. And uh-huh. so I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy shit. Let's go. Let's do this. And, um, then, you know, he, he, Jennifer, who was the uh, lead, and Keenan, who who was fantastic, who's a, a novelist for a living, and um, the fellow. Oh my God, the fellow played my boyfriend. Oh geez, oh geez. Oh my God, his name will come to me. He'll kill me. But anyway, okay, they were they were fantastic. Greg was a lot of fun. Um, it was the last time that I had a uh, head cast done. So um, there was just like a lot of like everything. And it was, as you know, practical, except for some CGI in the beginning with Lloyd. Lloyd is in that one too. And um, <laughs> it, it was just, it was absolutely so much fun. And it wasn't like, oh, all the planets aligned and the conditions were perfect. No, it was freezing. And Keenan and Jennifer had love scenes and they were freezing. And I had to be painted in orange and I was naked with a fake vagina on my stomach. And, you know, it was cold. But so it wasn't like, oh, these things were, you know, perfect. But it was just, it was just one of those things. It was just, everything just was right. And it was fun and it was great and everybody was there for all of the right reasons um just it just had a magical feel and this only happens so you know it's so rare when this happens it's not even funny i can count on one hand uh but this is one of the times that it's happened so um yeah i i was just like you know absolutely i just became immediately became a big big fan of greg's and i was just like yeah this is that's friggin awesome really really awesome yeah i'm glad you mentioned all those new york movies the head and lauder movies and uh and chud and uh they always have that that, that certain yeah. fe- that certain feel to them like it's kind of dirty. <laughs> I don't know. There's something Great. about the new york yeah about the 80s new york that's yeah, there new york. yeah yes, exactly all the oh, yeah, it was just, joints and the, yeah, it's just dirty. It's oh. and they all try to clean it up. It's like, nah, leave it dirty. I'd way, I way know, rather I know, but, you know. Exactly. Well, you don't want to get yeah, that. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's why I love that's, they have a I, new I, show called uh, The Deuce on HBO. And it's all about, like, right around then. I'm like, oh, I love this. Yes, give me the grit. Yeah, everybody everybody keeps mentioning this show to me, and I haven't seen it yet, but everybody says oh, that I would great. love it because anybody who knows my taste. Yeah. Yeah, you'll love did, it. Uh, did you ever see, I'm sure you have, um, Blood Sucking Freaks? By Joel, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, Reed. yeah. 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 It's, a few years ago, he went and, because uh, we had him on the show, he's, he's the man. And so he invited us to, to come and see him if we were in uh, Manhattan. And so we spent uh, the day with him and uh, it was so great just walking around and he was talking about, I was like, you know, all oh, this used to be the fruit stand where it would be all the gay guys would come out and show you their, their junk. And he's like, ah, I miss the good old days. And it, <laughs> it was a very fun experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah
I know. Like, it's so funny because you walk around New York and you never in a million years would think that you would reminisce over, because, um, you know, so many decades I lived on Ludlow Street and that's down the Lower East Side. And who would ever guess? Because now, you know, across the street from that old apartment is this, you know, massive, massive, like upscale hotel. You couldn't mm-hmm. give away those apartments um, in the 70s or 80s, like really. And there, oh, there was like rubble, like in those old um, movies that you see that were really underground New York movies, um, where there's just like entire lots of just rubble. And they really were. And, and who would have ever thought that you would get nostalgic over a lot of rubble. I mean, but it's true. It's true. Because, yeah, it's just Chicago. too... Yeah. yeah, is that right? Yeah, I'm uh-huh. about Chicago. Yeah. I'm from the mean streets. Yeah, you get... I'm from the mean streets of Cape Cod, so... Who knew? But it's probably the most dangerous of all three. Wouldn't that be funny? Wouldn't that be funny? Believe like, me, oh no, you're from, you're from fucking Cape Cod. Oh, shut up! No way, you fucking made it out of Cape Cod. That's awesome. But you know what? I bet it's beautiful. It is very nice. It is very nice. And uh, recently, my town, which is, n- is never mentioned anywhere, uh, has been immortalized in a meme. I think that's the same. Because I'm from a town called Sandwich, Sandwich and I never think anything <laughs> about this police car say Sandwich Police on them. But someone took that and put it all over the internet. And I've been tagged in it like a thousand times from everyone. Because I'm that probably that the first person who knows from was Sandwich. Jimmy Kimmel? It might, I don't know, but I just don't tag in it Kimmel all the time. Something. Uh-huh. Yeah. It is very funny. <laughs> it's something I've never thought about because I just see it. But it's just funny to see a car. What's it's a the sandwich. place? I didn't, I didn't hear you. Oh, sandwich. I didn't hear you say what? Sandwich. Like this, like oh, a sandwich. right, right, right. Okay, okay, okay. So, yep, yep. So the police cars you know, they actually say sandwich police on them, which uh, if you're not from yes. around here, it is very uh, peculiar that there would be the sandwich police. <laughs> Okay, down here, all our cable, the cable company down here is Cox, C-O-X, and I, I still find it hilarious every, it, like, every time I see it, it, it's just Cox, it's like I call in for my cable company, this is Cox, how can we help you, and I'm like, <laughs> yes. You know, I it's, know it's, it's, it's you know, <laughs> next thing, hey, listen, Heather, next thing, you know, with all this political correctness, and I'm not, I'm not playing it down, but next thing you know, you're going to change the name of the cable company from Cox to like, you know, the yes. wall or oh, something PC, right. because God forbid that you call yeah. Cox. Cable company. I'm like one of the least PC people ever, and oh man, living in a PC world is so hard, so very hard. I just, oh, I tell you man. something, it was it's very depressing because I've seen it, it become I've seen it become it so is. PC. I'm ready to vomit. I, I can't take it. I and and, and I'm like, here's something. Children be like this. Let them be free. Oh. Let them express you themselves. You know what? I. I I, I swear it's so it, it's it's to the point of like everybody's the same inside. What you're doing is just forcing everybody to be fake humans because oh. it's not like oh by forcing people to be PC you're actually changing the person. Mm-hmm. Oh, I tell a certain jokes and people look at me like I must be the most deviant person they've ever met, and I'm like, well, really? That wasn't even that bad. I'm like, I just asked you what your favorite Chinese food mine has come up some young guy. You know, and people are like, oh, you said that. <laughs> I know. I oh man. I know. I it's it, people can't hack it. People can't hack it. So when Babs asked me about uh, you know, how do you get through this, that and the other thing, it's like, geez, in comparison, how do you get through this PC crap? No, shit. That's, that's the yeah. question. 
That's the question. Seriously, that's the question because it's like, you know, you're going to have people freak out. You're going to have people go the other way and then all the adult shit's going to fucking hit the fan. And like, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to end, end with this thought. Okay. If, if this is how bad off we are. Okay. This is how bad off we are that people are willing knowingly to vote in a guy who's a pedophile just so they can get his vote in the future because he's a, of a certain party, Republican. Hello. And this, this, this makes my mind explode. Are you really telling me that a pedophile is worth getting the anti-abortion vote? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm not even, I don't even care what somebody's take on abortion is. That's not my point. I don't care if you're for it, against it. I don't care. My point is, is that, is that really, you're willing to throw all of your morals away just to get this fucking vote? Really? This is yeah, what's what making my mind is. spin. Yeah. And I, I I'm just like, I, I'm speechless. I, I'm speechless. I, I, I got nothing. Yeah. I was like, really, if they, yeah. I, I just, I got nothing. Mm. And at the same time, Al Franken's <laughs> in a big house. It makes me want to just cry. That's why yeah, I but, choose to remain on PC because if I can't laugh at myself and if I can't have a sense of humor, all I'm going to do is lay in my bed and cry every single day at what's going on in the world. <laughs> So, I yeah, have to be able to laugh. you know, I have to be able to, laugh. I know, I have to be able to joke because otherwise it's just fucked. <laughs> it's just straight up fucked. So, okay, so, so, so what, what's the most uh, un, un PC thing we could say to, to end this? Like, you know, we can go out <laughs> on that note. Like, this is the most okay. non PC thing. You guys go because I have to, I'll think of some, but you guys go. Well, my I'm favorite, spot, my, favorite uh. my favorite joke to uh, tell a feminist or an angry lesbian, which you know I'm a feminist, I'm not an angry lesbian, but I've got friends that are, um, is to tell them this joke, which is, "What do you tell a woman with two black eyes? Nothing. You already told her what? twice." But no, mom. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I like and that I one. I can't. I, I can't talk it with a joke. <laughs> but that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> well, here's here's one. Here's All one. Right. Okay, you're really un PC. Really not not PC. Both of you guys should go get fucked up the ass tonight. Unlucky. <laughs> 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 there you go. <laughs> and if, I'm just, I'm just saying. Like, I don't know. I don't even know what that means. But I, I just thought, well, you know, I, I'm bound to offend somebody somehow, uh, right? I mean, that's it's not a, a godly thing to do, as far as like the the hardcore uh, religious people, because you're always uh-huh. supposed to have like sex to make body. babies. <laughs> well, what happens when you when you can't make babies anymore, bitch? Then you can't have sex <laughs> anymore. There's all kinds of ninety year old ladies having good blow jobs and oral sex and all that good stuff. Uh, well, I used to work at the <laughs> nursing home. But what's going on? So. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. Those those people are sick, depraved. <laughs> Seniors, they're fucking out of their minds. The, the shit Whoa. they get up to, turn to <laughs> S and M and B and D and fucking really sick shit. <laughs> well, well, I now, now you just discovered the next movie you can direct. You can direct a movie mm-hmm. about a about a nursing home. I actually had a there you go. when I was like 18 and I had uh, one of my, my clients or whatever, she would literally piss herself whenever there was this one night nursing assistant on 
and just because he would have to come and clean her up, she would piss herself every Ooh. night that he was on. I'm like, what girl, a, what you a nasty. good idea. I know. Well, like, hell yeah. I'm like, put that in the Rolodex. I'm going to remember that for later. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually in a nursing home last year. I was in a rehab for a while. It was actually in a nursing Neil home. Neil pissed himself and, every time well, there was that my, male nurse. My, uh, <laughs> my, uh, my, uh, I had to share a room with with a guy. He was ninety five, ninety three, or something. Fred, and every and, and so the nurses would come in and they'd be they'd always go, Fred, why do you have your 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 uh your pants down around your ankles again? And he'd just go, Oh, I'm. Oh, I'm just uh, so happy to see you. And uh, it was not a... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> happy to see you. <laughs> oh, see, that's... See, I, I like hearing these stories. I don't want to hear about, like, people abusing seniors in seniors' homes, right? Like, sure. you know, beating them up. I want to hear uh-huh. about the... I want to hear about the seniors abusing the young people that take care of them. <laughs> I'm not talking underage. I'm not sure. Yeah. No, yeah. she was a big yeah. yeah. I, I like that. Good for them. Go on the high note, people. <laughs> Agree. Neil, what's your own PC thing? Um, I gotta think. Um, uh, well, I can't call. Plug plug. I can't call my uh. My my coon skin cap, a coon skin cap anymore. I have to call it my uh, African American skin cap. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You can't you can't do it. Oh yeah, and then, you know that reminds me. There was oh my god, I saw um, Zodiac Killer. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, the movie was made in 1971. Okay, and uh, it was literally made by a guy who owned uh, one or two pizza joints and he made this movie he really wanted to get into movies but he made this movie literally to try to lure out the real zodiac killer because you know he screened it and everything where the zodiac killer was thought to to live and everything so he made this movie to tempt him out like so it was made in 71 so i'm putting it in context right Mm -hmm. so there was one black guy in the movie so the credits roll and Oh my God! He credits the guy black guy. <laughs> I mean, not guy in phone booth or you know what I mean, character name. Uh-huh. Like, black guy, and then the guy's name. I'm like, oh no, no, no! I mean, I just really. <laughs> I mean, like he could only get away with that because there's only one black guy in the movie. But it's just like so fucking weird. Um, and yeah, oh, the, the misogynistic stuff in the beginning. Oh, it was so funny. So <laughs> funny. If you don't, if you see this movie for any other reason, see it for the dialogue, like in the first half of the movie, like this one guy, he just w- comes out of nowhere. Uh, it's like, so it's one of those so bad. It's fantastic movies. And mm-hmm. this guy just comes out of nowhere and he talks to the main character and he says, you know, I like women. I like um, young, plump, and dumb. (laughs) (laughs) Just like out of nowhere. He just announces this information. Like, and I'm like, okay. Uh, The guy didn't ask him. It was just like, just (laughs) one of these things. And everybody's like a whore or a bitch. Like everybody, everybody, (laughs) like the wife, the the women at the club, like everybody. They're, they're a whore or a bitch. And the, the writing for the women was just like, they were whores or bitches. I mean, that's all there was. Like it it was one of the other, just horrible things. And the guys were just like, um, Oh, it's funny. So funny. You really, you really got to check it out. It's hilarious. When I first moved down here, uh, they have a theater here, and uh, I was actually able to go see Blazing Saddles on the big screen, which I never in this day and age thought I would be able to see that movie on the big screen. And I was just like, this is a life-changing event. I'm like, this is amazing. I'm like, I love Mel Brooks. I've never, like, and it's funny because in that movie, the people that are the absolute lowest that get ripped on the worst are the Irish. 
I'm like, people think a lot of things about that movie, but it's the Irish that catch the most shit in that movie. I'm like, I just love that movie. It's great. But I'm like, well, I guess it's mm-hmm. okay to get played down here. I am in the South. <laughs> see, I, I don't see what would be yeah. wrong with that. I mean, it's a classic, but I, I have seen that. It's been a lot of people want it, like, boycotted at places. Oh, yeah. Very bizarre to me. It's Mel Brooks. I mean, he just doesn't hold back. Well, it's really making fun of racism. It's not, you know, racist. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was just one of those things (laughs) where people are so PC these days that Mm -hmm. it was not a movie that I would think would play in a theater, you know? And there were African-American people there, you know, watching it and laughing with it, you know? They thought it was funny, too. Right. You know? It's a funny movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know what it is too. Like half of this stuff is like people are afraid that people don't get it. Like they're not smart enough to to get some of this stuff. Like I'm not talking about outright, you know, insulting and all this kind of sit, stuff. But you know, I, I everybody's got like a sense of humor. Everybody's, you know, people are smarter than than a lot of people give them credit for as, as far as like the movie business goes writing and and filmmaking and television making i mean television's like actually really amazing right now it's like better than most of the movies uh which is an interesting place to be in this day and age but um you know i yeah i think uh the the dumbing down stuff is just uh it's pretty boring but mm-hmm. yeah absolutely i i agree mm-hmm. Well, it's been uh, great to have you on, Debbie, and we hope to uh, do it again sometime. Well, thank you very much, and uh, you guys have a wonderful night. Thanks for having me on, and I will um, comment you again in the near future. All right. We're going to stalk you on the Internet. Yes, because stalk stalk away. Stalk me on Instagram, Twitter, wherever you want to stalk me. Please. You're You're on the Twitter. You're on the Instagram. You're on the Facebook. So can, uh, <laughs> all of the does. Yes, yes. Have our uh, listeners find you. The, I mean, <laughs> yes. yes, I'm on I'm all over it. that place. Mm, just everywhere. Space. Constantly. All right. And, uh, they just search okay. Debbie Rashawn. They're going to find you. Um, yeah, yeah, thing, yeah. Maybe? You find all yeah. Ki- you, you find all kinds of stuff. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> Um, you are our final guest for the first annual Scream Queen month, and um, I was just wondering if you do the honor of screaming for us. <laughs> you can um, okay. If you can, if you're, if, if you can, it's fine. Well, I'm only concerned about the people I'll wake up. <laughs> <laughs> in the in the building. I mean, I really am. I think they'll call the police. <laughs> what I should so do is go find a silent scream. Here's my silent scream. Yeah. My silent scream. <laughs> Excellent. Sorry. I'll yes, 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 yes. I can't get back. I mean, I'll, you know, talking about PC. I don't want to go to jail tonight. You know what I mean? I'll, I can't wake anybody up. I'll just edit it in a screen. And listen, a, a, a silent scream is worse than a, just imagine right. somebody choking me. Like, oh, there we go. See, there you go. <laughs> uh, uh, you guys are great. Oh, thank you for a fun time, guys. Okay. Yeah. It's been excellent. Thanks so much, Debbie. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. This is Ashley Zhang from the Monster Squad, also known as the youngest Scream Queen, and you're listening without your head.